All right, everybody, welcome to our first ever Sonobui Office Hours. Uh, my name is George Castro, and I'm going to be your host today. Um, and I have with me Timothy St. Clair, uh, one of the leads on Sonobui. Tim, if you could just introduce yourself real quick. Sorry. Hi. <clears throat> so uh, today, kind of the goal of talking about Sonobui is to give you an overview of what, what Sonobui is, what CNCF conformance is, and how sort of uh, testing for your clusters and your cluster lifecycle kind of all mash together. Uh, why don't I share my screen right here real quick? Sure, um, while, while you sort that out real quick, let me just let, let people know how this is gonna work since this is our first one. So welcome, this is our first office hours. We're gonna try to have these uh, probably once a cycle, uh, maybe more depending on, on what users feel. You can join us on, uh, hash Sonobui on the Kubernetes Slack and feel free to ask your questions live there and then we'll get to them during the live screen. And then um, what we're gonna do now is start with Tim kind of showing us why, um, why Sonobui needs to exist. And I guess one of my first questions, uh, Tim, as, as you start your presentation here is, what is Kubernetes conformance? Why do I need it? Why is it important? Um, that sort of thing. So with that, Tim, feel free to take it away. Yeah, so the, the CNCF started a conformance effort a while ago because Kubernetes, like any good cluster manager, has many different ways to configure itself. There's, and also has multiple layers of extensions, right? So if you're working on a cloud provider, say GCP, and you're working on a different cloud provider like Amazon or DigitalOcean or uh, you name it, there's a bunch of different integration points that exist. So the purpose of Sunabui is to set up a baseline what people call conformance. And the conformance is a set of behavioral tests that verify um, the, that the expectations of the API are met when a user is trying to use uh, their Kubernetes cluster. So the intent is that as you create a cluster or you manage or change configuration of your cluster over time, that you have a set of tests that you can run to verify that your cluster is thumbs up or thumbs down on whether or not you can take us, you know, a certain set of features and transpose them onto any other service, right? So the idea and the promise of Kubernetes itself was the idea of an abstraction layer for the cloud, right? And the conformance effort is meant to provide those guarantees. So that way over time, you know, the suite of conformance tests will expand and there will be different types of suites for different uh, integration points. But uh, the, the intent is that you have some guarantee that you can go back in a set of tests that you can run yourself to make sure that you're, uh, you're in conformance and that you can, trans you can take a workload from one cluster and move it to another one from a different provider. So to give you an overview, there are tons of providers of Kubernetes, just like, it's, it's almost like a shock and awe diagram. Um, you know, you name a cloud provider, they probably have run the certification process. There's also different vendors that do sort of hosted service offerings, which kind of abstract away the cloud provider, like Giant Swarm is an example of that. I think Containership is too. Uh, plus there are, you know, infrastructure vendors like IBM and VMware is there, and et cetera. Um, and if we scroll down here, there's also Heptio for a quick start. So uh, just real quick, that also would include if I'm at work and I have an IT shop, you know, my own internal quote unquote distribution of Heptio, right? Exactly. Or, I'm sorry, so, of, of, of Kubernetes. Yeah. So if you if you were running a, an internal IT shop and you want to go it alone, mm -hmm. right, you, you, you're, you have a smart group of folks who need to customize things in a way that's not uh, easily doable given some of the installers that exist. You know, maybe you have some custom integration with some different hardware. You can absolutely leverage the conformance tests. They're meant to be uh, sort of hermetically sealed and run on top of the cluster itself from inside the cluster. So you don't you don't have to um, sort of bundle it up. We have a way to just apply a YAML and go right. Okay. So that's that's kind of the 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 first stage evaluation of, of, of uh, Sonobui, right? So a, a common first case, you, first use case is to run conformance, but Sonobui's intent 
um, was was much grander. Uh, so if I go back in history, uh, Joe Bita and myself worked on uh, sort of the SIG scale group for a long time. And we had different vendors. You know, I, at the time I worked for Heptio, or sorry, at the time I worked for Red Hat. Uh, and uh, Joe was Joe was on his own and other people from Google uh, and Samsung were all there and were like, we want to have a way of having a benchmark, right? And basically bundling up a set of configuration as well as tests together and then give that to somebody else so that they could recreate the exact same experiment uh, and then get, you know, compare the results as an AB comparison. And nothing existed at the time. And when we were starting Heptio, Joe and I uh, had talked about, uh, you know, this problem existing, not just for that space, but also for, you know, there's a million providers out there. You have no way of guaranteeing. And that, and that was kind of the precursor of some of the CNCF conformance effort. So it kind of dovetails into like a long history of wanting to have uh, sort of a hermetically sealed way to produce sort of experiments and get results out of it. And the CNCF uh, conformance effort is one type of experiment, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't do many different kinds of experiments. Okay, so sorry, I'm gonna interrupt you with a whole bunch of new user questions here, yeah. um, if that's okay. It, it, okay, so it feels like usually when people are talking about conformance and end to end, it feels like, okay, I've got my new cluster, I set it up, I either pass or fail. If I pass, I'm good to go. If I'm fail, you know, I have stuff to fix and things like that. And I'm sure you'll show us what it actually does and all that stuff. But I think what you're trying to say is, is, is it just only about installation? Like what, what part of the life cycle? Like, like is this something that you're checking? If, if you're an operator, are you checking your cluster constantly? Is it one of those? It depends upon what your life cycle and changes are that you want to. Sunabui was totally configurable. Like in, in true customer management, we have like we've, and the people that worked on it in the beginning were also people who had uh, lots of years of cluster management experiences. Like there's a knob mm -hmm. for that, right? So every option and ways you could run an experiment, we wanted to have a knob for it. So the idea was that you'd only run conformance tests. You typically during major life cycle events you're changing configuration for your cluster, you're upgrading your cluster, you've provisioned a new one. Um, you know, those are the typical lifecycle events where you'd want to do a full qualification because the, you want to run those tests in a way uh, that is non-destructive, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to run it uh, kind of perturbating workloads on, on your environment. You want to run it being mindful that you already have work in this environment and you're, you just did an upgrade and you want to verify that everything's okay. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's the common use case, but because we built it so configurable, we kind of intended it to be used uh, for any type of event. So say for example, I am an app developer, right? I could write a plugin for Sunabui as an app developer. And I could, every time I push an update for maybe like a software stack, I could have a qualification for that software stack that then gives me a hermetically sealed experiment with the results that I can archive into my data mining service or, or some other analysis service to back off or do whatever I want to as part of an application lifecycle management. Okay, so um, can you give me a little bit more detail when you say hermetically sealed? Does that mean it goes into the cluster and comes back out the same way or it doesn't touch the cluster? What exactly so, do you mean? Sonobuy, its end result basically gives you all the configuration it used to run as well as all of the results, right? So sometimes when you do an experiment, you know, if you have the black box, you, you, you have to have the recipe for how to recreate uh, all the steps that you did. Mm -hmm. Sonobui provides you with the recipe plus the data, right? Okay. Okay, that's all uh, you can move okay. on. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna dip in with questions there. And those of you listening on the stream, uh, if you're just joining us, uh, thank you for joining us. Feel free to pop your questions in hash Sonobui and we'll punt them over to Tim and answer them as time allows, so. So I kind of talked a little bit about like, you know, some of the history in the real vision was like, not just cluster lifecycle uh, testing, but entire 
application lifecycle integration and testing. It's basically the what, what I kind of envision for the long term is it's kind of the centerpiece for continuous CI inside of your infrastructure, right? Um, so I kind of have specced out a very simple demo for anybody to get started. So that way, like if, if you're just running on a Mac, you can easily go uh, and start to get rolling, right? I forgot to mm -hmm. shut down Slack here. I want to get notifications all the time. So if you're if you're just running uh, on a Mac, you can easily get rolling, right? Mm -hmm. So currently, I have uh, Docker for Mac uh, running. So if I go to my Docker and I go to Preferences, there's a Kubernetes option. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Docker's website, uh, you know this is like the easiest way for folks who are not necessarily familiar with all this stuff to just get rolling. Sure. Um, and they have good instructions there on how to set up the local Kubernetes and and once that's all up and running, um, you, you can verify that's there. But for the precursor for this experiment, we're going to use Go to kind of, you know, it's almost like a developer kind of soup to nuts starting to going, right? Mm -hmm. So you just want to verify your Go version, right? So let me see if I can drag my, my window here. So I got, I don't have the latest version of Go on my Mac. I got Go 1.10.1. Uh, I think it's sure. 1.10.2 plus. And and real quick, for those of you, I, I believe Kubernetes for Docker for Mac and Windows went stable last week sometime. So that's uh, great. If you're going to try this experiment, probably upgrade to the GA version right before this. And then we'll go ahead and post this just in the show notes like that so people can follow along. Mm -hmm. So the, the first thing I want to do is verify, because there's many ways, and sometimes you know developers have, a, uh, have too much stuff kind of mm -hmm. running in the background on their laptop is to get the context. So, I, you know, I have Minikube here, plus I have Docker. Oh, sorry to interrupt you one more time. Can you up the font size a little bit? Oh, sure. Maybe two or three ticks, thanks. Is that better? Uh, a little bit more. Perfect, okay, All right. thanks. So uh, here I have the Docker desktop for Mac. You know, it's the default configuration. You can just verify. Uh, Coop control get pods minus minus all namespaces. It's kind of like my de facto go to to verify that like all oopsies. Right, that yes, is my de facto for you know just verifying that all the components for Kubernetes are are up and running. So it's all there. It's good. Um, there is something that's terminating, which is interesting. Oh, that's that end to end test is not been cleaned up. So. <clears throat> um, so now we have, we verified that Docker for Mac is up and running. It's running Kubernetes in the background. Uh, the next step is to basically get the latest version of Sonobuoy, right? Like you don't, we typically run a set of tests and verifications on the upstream uh, master branch, but you can also go to uh, uh, the Sonobuoy repository and go to releases uh, and Underneath the releases tab, you can actually download the binaries if you if you don't want to use Go, right? If you want to mm -hmm. just basically download the the Darwin binaries. So this is just so for me on my Linux box. I just w get that thing, stick it in user local bin, and, yeah. and go. Okay. Yeah, you could w get or you know if you have Go installed, you just do go get minus u. So this is this presupposes that you already have uh, all your Go path and everything else set up as part of your environment. Sure. Um, so I always do this because then I do which Sonobui, uh, and then it's underneath my workspaces go bin directory. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's it's already been pulled, it's there, I'm ready to roll. Um, so now that's there, uh, a simple thing that you know any user should do is just Sonobui help. So we we built a CLI around Sonobui to make it easier for folks to interface with. Okay. So, their standard operations, and we kind of wrap the common use case to make it simple. So the common use case, as we talked about earlier, is basically people want to run the conformance tests, right? Mm -hmm. um, people want to verify and qualify their, their cluster. So we kind of optimize that use case with a bunch of uh, defaults and uh, options that exist there. So what are some of the commands that exist? Um, Let's go from, I'll, I'll get the, a little bit out of order, right? Version. So over time, we want to do more things with version. Right now, it just basically prints the Sonobuoy version. Um, 
typically the, the way folks run it is if you just want to go from zero to running is you re execute Sunably run. Uh, you do need a localized kube config in order for you to run that. So uh, in this case, you know, we already have Docker for Mac running. So the kube mm -hmm. config and the context is set up already for us. Yep. And, so, and for the new people, um, Docker for Kubernetes will automatically configure that for you. You're not copying dot files around. Correct? Exactly. Okay. Yep. Uh, so then you ba basically all you need to do is do Sunaboy run, uh, and that will, by default, run the conformance test with the kube config that exists in the, the machine. Uh, if you, if you want to inspect things or if you want to modify or tweak stuff, which we'll do as part of our run here, is you're going to use Sunaboy gen. Gen basically generates the manifest that will be submitted uh, <clears throat> to the cluster. Uh, and you can tweak and modify things because for this particular experiment of running Docker for Mac with Kubernetes, uh, you do need to tweak something. Um, we'll go into detail later about what that tweak is. Mm -hmm. uh, another set of tests that exists are, or another set of command CLI options that exist is uh, there's a little wrapper to make it convenient for inspecting the artifact, uh, which is based that you get via retrieve. Uh, this is meant to be just like a utility to, to give you a thumbs up, thumb, quick thumbs up, thumbs down. Do I have any failures? Right? Sure. And by artifact, you mean the results that Sono we generate of the tests? Yeah. Uh, yes, the tests as well as all the other data that it collects. Okay. So, so okay. Sonobui collects a lot of data by default with, with, okay. with running Sonobui. And the purpose of that is so that way, if, when a person has a failure, they have enough information to actually inspect what are the details of this failure and why it's failing? Sure. Because if you just have the end-to-end -end test results, that's usually not enough information to be able to figure out why something failed. Okay. Um, some other things, there's a status command. So internally inside of Sonobui, it's actually a master worker paradigm. Um, so <clears throat> there's a Sonobui aggregator that gets run uh, on the machine. The aggregator is basically, a, you know, the, the job that submits more jobs, which submits the plugins. Mm -hmm. The plugins can run asynchronously. In the future, what we really wanted to do is we wanted to have an Argo style workflow engine for the plugins. So that way, if a person had a very controlled experiment, you know, you want to say like, don't add all the dry, dry and wet ingredients together. It'd be like, you know, do A, get all your dry ingredients ready, ready. Mm -hmm. then add B, add your wet ingredients, and then bake for two hours, right? Right. Uh, the purpose of Argo is would be I'd have a DAG workflow, so I'd have a model by which I can give to somebody else to reproduce the exact same set of steps for uh, for creating an experiment. This is super useful if I'm doing sort of performance and scale testing for for large hyperscale deployments. Uh, what other things did I miss here? Uh, delete cleans up all the details. Uh, logs is super useful if you want to sort of uh, see what's going on uh, as the job is running because sometimes you're running the conformance tests will take a while, right? Mm -hmm. in, in, this, in this demo, we won't run all the conformance tests. We'll basically focus a set of tests. So, so is the logs command something like you would do a Sonobui run, it would fire stuff off, you open a terminal and just have Sonobui logs? You just watch it scroll or? Yep, you just, just like tl minus f, there's logs okay. minus f, right? And okay. logs minus f will basically just stream the logs for the pods that are running okay. personably back to the uh, the main terminal. Right, because when I've run it before, I've seen it, I've done like a watch on cube control to kind of see what's running. So the logs dash f will kind of give you that live feed. Exactly, so, I mean, okay. that was that was a feature request from users. Okay. And you know it makes a ton of sense because it, it takes so long, and sometimes you know operators want to know like what's going on, what's the state of things. Right? Sure, and and that kind of leads into my next question is, or unless you're about to fire off a run and then we no no no. Um, Go ahead. When you actually do a run, like and you're an operator, what exactly what's the load on the cluster here? Is this something that I need to plan for off? Of cycle or how how invasive are we talking about here? Because I'm sure you could adjust, you know, how many tests you can run and stuff at once. Yeah. You know so there are about. there are hidden knobs that we don't expose on purpose. Okay. Um, but but power users will figure it out and know how to do it. Mm -hmm. The the test suite currently runs serially, um, so it runs one end to end test at a time. 
and okay. make sure it gathers up the results, you know, A then B then C then D. Uh, the reason it does that is we want to minimize the load if you're doing it live, right? Mm -hmm. um, there, there do exist people, there are providers, uh, I, I probably shouldn't name names, who want to run as many things in parallel as possible because they want it as part of their CI automation for their distribution, right? right? And there exists knobs to do that. The problem with uh, doing that type of testing is it's more, it can, it can be more disruptive. And sometimes there, is a, there can be opportunities for flakes because you're trying to do as many things as possible. Sure. Um, so you increase your probability, your chance of having a flake test, uh, plus your, um, you know, you're, you're also causing massive disruption in a cluster. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, I guess, then your, your mindset is design it in a way so it's non-invasive so that you're running it similarly, like how you would do a backup or something. It's a thing I need to do, but I'm not going to, you know, move a bunch of stuff out of there prior to. Right. Exactly. So we, we okay. tried to optimize the 80% use case. The 80% use case was like the first initial standup and the upgrades. So mm -hmm. if you already have a cluster that's running, you want to be able to run something to qualify your upgrade, but you don't want to, you know, you, you don't, you already have jobs. It's part of your, it's part of your work to make sure that your cluster is uh, up and running. And if those workloads go down, if I do yeah. something that's too disruptive, you know, you're going to get a phone call or some type of pager duties. Right. Like Right. It'd be silly to break your cluster after upgrading it to check to see if you're breaking your cluster. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so there, are, there are multiple user stories and there are options for both. Sure. Sure. Um, and typically speaking, are there any best practices that you give, give people around this? So you, I mean, you know, obviously you mentioned the upgrades and things like that, but what about when you do features, let, let me just use an example, right? Uh, I have a cluster, it's passing conformance at the time. Um, and then at some point, RBAC becomes a thing that needs to be enforced. Like what happens? So that's a configuration change, right? Okay. Like, so anytime there's a configuration change where you're turning on a feature or turning off a feature, mm -hmm. you, you typically want to run a set of conformance tests because those conformance tests will check if the feature is enabled. Mm -hmm. If it is enabled, it'll run a set of tests to verify that it's properly configured. Okay. Not, not all features are, are that easy. Right? Some features will basically ripple configurations across multiple components. Right. And you want to make sure that all of your knobs, for lack of a better term, uh, cluster managers have a, have a tendency, people who work in cluster management, for lack of a better term, have had that vernacular in place for a long time. So they've always called there's a knob for that. Right. So, so they've, they've had, um, if you're going to switch a, a given knob in one place, you need to make sure that the other knobs for a feature are also properly configured. Right, right. Okay, uh, those of you just joining us, uh, please feel free to ask questions in hash Sonobui. Um, so are you, are you gonna run this thing then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah, let's do this. I'll give you an overview of basically the, the standard CLI options. So one thing we're gonna do before we actually run on the, the Docker for Mac configuration is Docker for Mac does not defaultly use systemd. So there's, there's two plugins that come enabled by default. Um, so for, for this, what we're going to do here is basically run Sonobui gen. We're going to only, we're going to specify a single test to run because otherwise if we set the full conformance test, the demo is long and boring and would never end, right? Mm -hmm. So we're basically going to say pod should be submitted or removed. It's a very basic test. This is kind of like the, if this doesn't work, nothing works, right? Gotcha. Uh, so we're going to put it into a file called non-systemd.yml, right? So one thing we're going to do is take a look at that configuration file. This is the manifest that it generates. So if I go here, uh, let me sort of move this down here. All right. We go into the Sonoboy directory and we look at this YAML file. One thing we will notice is that there's a bunch of, we'll, we'll kind of walk through the details here. Right? Sure. Right. So it's going to create a, a Sonoboy namespace. Uh, it's going to create a service account for Sonoboy. Now, uh, it's going to create a bunch of RBAC roles uh, for that service account, right? But the one thing it's going to need is it's going to need root, right? Now, why does Sonobui need root? This has been a conversation piece that uh, 
we've had back and forth between some of the developers and some of the mm -hmm. people in the community for a while is that Sonobuoy is basically exercising all the API behavior uh, or can exercise all the API behavior for this. Mm -hmm. So it, we've tried to create a specific RBAC role for Sonobuoy using audit to RBAC for the default. And it is super long. It is almost untenable for mm -hmm. most people to do that. Uh, and that only, that only narrows the focus to conformance, right? Which is a problem because some people might want to go beyond conformance. Sonobuoy is a wrapper for the entire, it's, a, it's basically a wrapper runner for uh, all of the end-to-end -end test suite. Conformance is only about 180 some odd tests. Okay. The entire end-to-end -end test suite is over 600. So if you have features you wanna test, if you have other things you wanna verify. Mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of has to have root to get access to the thing that you wanna test. Exactly, the entire API surface area. Cause it's gonna be creating and deleting and modifying and doing all kinds of things in your cluster. Sure, and, and just to ask a follow up question. So, you know, obviously that has security implications. Can you kind of, what, um, how have you thought about the security implement implications here? Like if I was trying to convince my boss and I was like, by the way, I need root on the cluster to do all these things. What do we, how do we make them feel better about that, I guess? Well, typically it'd have to be the operator who's running this. Um, right. Another thing too, is you can qualify your, what you're doing before you do it on your actual clusters. Like this experiment here is a good example to okay. make sure that what you're running and what you're doing and the results you're getting are, are what you'd expect. Right. 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 So, so this is that whole hermetically sealed thing, right? It goes in exactly. and it goes so out. You can, okay. Exactly. So you'll get a tarball artifact at the end of this run on this little you know, sandbox environment and you can compare AB comparison against what you get on your cluster, right? Okay. So that way you can verify that my Sunnibuoy run that I'm running for this localized thing collects this data and runs these experiments. Uh, and this is what I should expect, right? Okay. Um, so the next bit is sort of some configuration information. So over here is this monster config.json file, which is serialized in a single line, which is kind of scary, right? Um, so you can pretty print this or do some other things to, to get the details uh, to make it cleaner. Um, down here below, this is the master configuration for the aggregator, right? So the, the Sonobuoy aggregator is basically the main service that runs and it has a configuration file with a bunch of options for modifying things, right? So in the case that I mentioned earlier, um, we basically have a set of plugins that Sonobuoy runs. Sonobuoy itself is basically a data collector and runner. Um, and in this case, what we want to do is delete the systemd uh, logs collector. Uh, the reason being is uh, this on the Docker for Mac for Kubernetes, or the Docker for Mac Kubernetes version doesn't have systemd running. So we just delete that one and save it. Right? And we're good to go. Right. But we'll still walk through the rest of the YAML here to sort of folks get the gist of what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, the next bit down below is a listing of configurations for the different plugins, right? So we built Sonobuoy to be extensible, right? Uh, so that way you can create your own custom configurations for your plugins. The aggregator on startup will basically list down what plugins do I have available, right? And if you want to, you can uh, modify your, your plugin set uh, so that we can run a different set of plugins. And we'll go into more detail on how you do that maybe later on and if people have questions at the end. So here are all the details about the different plugins. Right? So by default, there's the end-to-end -end test plugin. So we saw that when we passed in focus, uh, it basically set the focus parameter, right? There's also a default skip parameter. And here's, here's the question you had earlier, is the default parallelization is set to one. You can modify this to be n. Uh, if you wanted to. I believe zero is go crazy. Um, the next one is the uh, systemd logs collector. So there's a plugin basically that we created that runs around in a daemon set, right? And mm -hmm. tries to collect all your systemd logs. Now, why would you want to do that for an experiment? Uh, you basically, if you're running something across your cluster and you're doing this experiment, you need to collect enough information across this environment in order for you to actually diagnose an issue if there's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the whole purpose of Sonobuoy is to give you enough 
uh, of that hermetically sealed artifact for you to understand the problem when there are problems that arise. And these are all the systemd logs for all the nodes. Correct, okay. uh, but they're capped. There's limits that we put on. We don't try to collect everything because otherwise it'd be too much. Sure. So we try to collect for a time window, uh, you know, so that way it's you know for the experiment itself that you're running. Gotcha. Um, next is this basically outlines the details of the config map. Uh, this runs the actual pod itself for Sunabui. Uh, do, 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 do. Here's the service. There's a service endpoint that it creates. The, basically, the service endpoint is uh, two parts. One part is so that way um, the workers can talk back to the master. Right? So if you're running all these plugins, these plugins need to report their data back. Uh, and then it aggregates all the results on that uh, master node. And mm -hmm. then when you do sort of a retrieve, it, it copies all that aggregated results off the master node for you. So we now have the non-systemd.yml file. It's all configured. I'll pause real quick. Are there any questions about all that? That was a ton of stuff. Yeah. Uh, appears like no questions so far. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask all the all the easy ones as we go. <laughs> right. So the next thing you do is basically, you know, you can apply the generated YAML or you can use Sonably Run. Mm -hmm. and we mentioned before that you, for this particular uh, use case, you'd want to remove the system D default plugin. Mm -hmm. So we're basically going to apply uh, the YAML and then you're doing the one test, the pod test. Yeah, and that's doing one test. Yep. So right now it's running uh, Sonoboy status. It's basically telling you that it's running one plugin. It's the mm -hmm. ETU plugin. Uh, Sonoboy logs minus F. Oops, I spelled something wrong. So here's how we mentioned before, like you can uh, see the inline logs. And the nice thing here is it, it's like inline between everything that's running, right? Okay. So if I scroll back up here a ways, what, what I see is um, this is basically the, the aggregator starting up the run. Here's where the aggregator then says, I need to submit more pods. I'm running the plugin in this case, which is the N10 test plugin. Now, all of a sudden, I'm starting to see the logs from the N10 test plugin. So when it when Sonobui starts, right, um, it basically, it, let me sh stop sharing my screen here for a second. I'll go back to this in a second. When, when Sonobui starts, it, it basically runs what's called the aggregator, right? We'll call it the AG, right? Uh, the aggregator then will read the config, right? So we'll call this the config. It reads in the config, and then it'll basically start up a bunch of workers, right? The workers, the worker has two parts, right? There's the actual worker pod, and there's the actual plugin. Uh, sorry, it's one pod, but there's two containers. Right. So the, the worker pod is super generic. There's a contract on the worker. Uh, the worker right there basically gets the data from the plugin and then reports that data back to a well-defined endpoint to the aggregator, which then coalesces all the data. So if I had a super large cluster, I you know, there's literally dot, 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 dozens and dozens or hundreds or thousands of these, right? Mm -hmm. So if I want to collect system D logs across my whole cluster, it needs to spawn, you know, hundreds of these and report all that data back to the AG, right? Sure. And does each plugin then get its own pod? Does each then? plugin use? So there's different types of plugins. Okay. Um, so they do run as their own pod, where every every pod for the different plugins would be run kind of like this. Right? Okay. And there's two types of plugins. There are daemon set plugins and there are run once plugins. Okay. The end-to-end -end test is a run once plugin, and the uh, this one is a daemon, or the one that I mentioned before, the, the system D1 is a daemon set plugin. Okay, so this is why you want to run them serially. It kind of visualizes why you default to. Yeah, and, and 
that's part of it. If you're going to run many plugins, uh, another part of it is the end-to-end -end test itself. So this would be like, you know, system D, uh, if this was the actual E2Es, right? Right. Um, and this would be the worker. And this is basically what, what we call the kube conformance test, conformance container. Okay. And that contains all the tests, right? This ha could have a parallelization factor of N. In that case, this container is literally spawning hundreds and hundreds of more pods in the environment. Mm -hmm. So, so right now we set the parallelization factor, as we saw in the configuration, to one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, out of curiosity, um, for those when people do those following along on their Mac or their laptop or whatever, when they do do a Sono buoy run, like the full thing, is that like a laptop melting moment, or is it like, do you generally encourage, oh hey, I'm playing with this. You run a no, subset we, of tests, is there like a light mode you're, or something? If, if you're playing with a subset of tests, I, I usually recommend, if you're just doing tinkering around, mm -hmm. I always start with the pod should be, uh, what's it called? Created and removed. Okay. Because that's a super simple test. That's a super simple smoke test. If it doesn't work, you know, your cluster's on fire. Right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, then if, uh, it, once you expand beyond that, I usually recommend, uh, you know, if you want to go the full conformance tests, you can run them. But if you look at the output of the conformance tests, there's a series of tags inside of the end to end tests. Okay. So the, the end to end tests are basically structured so that they have uh, a string tag inside of there where you could have node tests, you could have networking tests. So basically, the different features are broken down into tags, right? So um, you could do a set of feature tests if you wanted to. So if you wanted to isolate a certain feature, you could do that. Uh, plus, if they're alpha beta features, there's a separate thing called a feature tag. Mm. And it'd be feature colon, whatever your name of your fancy feature is, right? Mm. So the way Kubernetes life cycle works for feature promotion is Kubernetes has a well-defined uh, process. It, it, I'd say it's well defined now. Process for how we do feature promotion over time. Mm -hmm. Things start as alpha. You know, alpha has certain guarantees, which is basically it could break at any time. Beta basically says we will guarantee that for the next version of beta or to the next up rev, we will support a trans a transition across mm -hmm. that. So that way you can still have it. Then there's GA. And G once it's GA, uh, it's usually prone to not change much over time because there's been a lot of qualification work to get that in place. And same with a deprecation policy the other way around, right? Exactly. There's a well-defined deprecation policy. Uh, and if folks are interested, we could probably uh, point folks at that. But this is kind of like, this gives you the idea of, of what it's trying to run, how you can configure different things to run over time. All right, should I go back to screen share? Are there any questions going on right now? Um, not so far. Yeah. Let's check the results. All right, so here, not, we went, we kind of did the side rail of how Sonobi does its mojo, right? Mm -hmm. And here, here's the logs that kind of show you the, the details. So like here, it says it's running a plugin. So as you saw from the other example, is it's submitting another pod. The pod basically has the worker as well as the plugin. And the plugin has a contract of how it sort of rolls up the results. And here's the plugin running its business. In our case, we're basically running uh, Ginkgo, which is the intent test. We're running Ginkgo for the intent test. And it basically says focus should be submitted or removed with all these other default parameters that were specified in the configuration YAML. Uh, we scroll down here, we basically see here's the actual test that it's running. And here are those tags that I was mentioning before. So conformance is a tag, no conformance is a tag, uh, okay, it's IO is a tag. Mm. Scroll down here, there's a bunch of details. Uh, uh, verifying the pod exited gracefully, uh, bearing the observed termination notice, yada, yada, yada. And basically the thing you're looking for at the very end of all of this is success. Right? 
yay, uh, basically ran uh, two tests, uh, 997 pa <laughs> have been skipped, right? So there's literally 999 tests in the test suite. <laughs> sure, so uh, just real quick, describe these. So you said how many were in the end-to-end? -end? The, the default conform, the total end-to-end -end test suite is 999. Okay. The conformance test suite is around 180. Okay, so that's the so, default conformance. So, so you have to pass those first 100 to kind of be considered a conformant Kubernetes, right? Yeah. As I mentioned, th this sort of effort is kind of in its its nascent phases. Sure. Um, so, um, over time, you're, a lot of those tests that we've already created will sort of mature into formalized conformance tests. Okay. I think the purpose of getting it started with a a, a bar that we had already created was basically to say any APIs that people truly depend upon in order for you to just get Kubernetes rolling, right? Right. You know, should be a conformance test. So, like, if sort of every basic concept that exists in Kubernetes has a set of conformance tests, the basic mm -hmm. basic concepts. Yeah. So we we expect that one hundred number to grow over time, right? So maybe a test, the other eight hundred whatever tests or whatever over time might graduate into like the default official tests or yes. like, do we encourage people to submit more tests and then they get beat up for, you know, six months or so. And then at one point get like, is there a process for that or? Yeah, people can absolutely submit tests to, uh, okay. into Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. So in, inside of Kubernetes proper, right? If I go to spaces, go, this is just kind of the, how I roll with my uh, default configuration for development. Mm -hmm. So, it, underneath the Kubernetes directory, or you know, in your GoPath or BKHIO Kubernetes, um, there's a separate test directory. Right? The test directory contains a set. It, Kubernetes has layers of tests. Right? There's uh, there's individual suites of tests, and there's the, the total end-to-end -end test suite. The one that we care about is higher-level behavioral end-to-end -end tests mm -hmm. because these should be run on any cluster. Right. Right. So it basically views Kubernetes as an endpoint and then executes the tests against those endpoints. Okay. Uh, and what you can do is basically grok the different tests that exist there. Uh, a good example here is common. If I scroll down the pods, uh, I can basically say it should be submitted or removed. Right. Mm -hmm. And here's the test that we were just looking at uh, inside of Kubernetes. And it, it's, it follows the Ginkgo framework for how it sort of uh, defines and runs the tests. And if people want to add new tests, they basically, you know, first you'd have to grok the entire, grok the area of tests that you think are missing in coverage. Sure. And then talk with the maintainer for a given area to understand, uh, you know, if we should add these tests or submit a PR. I sure. usually don't recommend submitting PRs blindly, uh, but to have some socialization because the project is so large and the reviewer, the reviewer count is not as large <laughs> right right so uh, that go ahead i was gonna say so when i'm when i'm running sono buoy it's not just where i am in the life cycle but you know i might have more tests that just keep coming down the pipeline right yep and do these new tests does it does it check upstream for these tests or do we is that like packaged as part of sono buoy itself so with inside of sono buoy we actually leverage a kube conformance container so if i scroll back up here and go to this and look at. So this is the actual container uh, okay. that we, in every minor release, we try to basically push a button and it auto builds a Kube con conformance container that we can leverage. Okay. Uh, I ideally, you know, we've talked with a bunch of the people upstream and we want to push that work into upstream. Mm -hmm. So that way it's published with, as any artifact would be as part of the results. Sure. Uh, currently, they publish a separate container, which is called Kubekins, which kind of rolls in, bakes in a bunch of extra information that uh, would not be directly consumable for other people. Okay. So this is a super simplified, stripped down version of just the, the tests that we need. Okay. All right. So generally speaking, keep your Sono buoy version up to date. I think is what you're getting at? Yeah, we do that. We actually do a lot of work uh, at the Heptio side. Okay. to make sure that um, that conformance, that the latest version of conformance works for all revisions of, uh, of supported versions of Kubernetes. Okay. So if you're actually looking at the main 
the main son of we uh, GitHub URL. Mm -hmm. Every time we do a release or our refresh, we always qualify for um, whatever supported versions exist in the wild. The reason we do this is because Sunabui is the tool that's used for the CNCF conformance testing. So we want to make sure that if there's a broader audience who is, you know, every provider, yeah. that, that it works for all the currently supported versions. Mm -hmm. So typically, as we talked about versioning earlier, uh, it is faux pas, uh, a bad form. And in fact, I don't think it's ever been done uh, to create a new conformance test after a release has gone out, right? So sure. if, if, there, if there has been like a 1.11 release, a minor revision, uh, there, there's never been an addition for the 1.11 cycle um, just because it has to go through a set of hurdles to be a conformance test. Right, and then that would eventually come in a dot 12. Exactly. Okay. Have we ever have we ever done adding a new test in a point release ever, like 1.11 dot? We can, add, we can absolutely add new tests, but not new conformance tests. Okay, good to know, okay. Um, and I don't know if you're gonna get to this, but the, there are the bundled tests. We have about 15 minutes left if you have questions to ask. Um, what about, Let's say I am using this at work and stuff, and I do have my own constraints with my environment on bare metal or whatever it is I'm doing. Um, how can I, is it easy to add my own tests that maybe are um, cluster or site or organizational specific that I wouldn't want? So Absolutely. those are the public tests and stuff. Like how, what about my own special sauce at work that I need for my work? We made Sonobui totally extensible. So if, like we mentioned very early in the beginning of our conversation is that we saw this as not just a thing for cluster lifecycle mm -hmm. testing, but for entire application lifecycle testing too as well, right? Because you can totally configure how you want to run it. Um, you could basically create your own set of configuration or plugins. Okay. And we have documentation on how the plugin, how you can create your own plugins. Mm -hmm. So there's two styles of plugins, uh, one of which is basically a job, right? For lack of a better term. Sure. And the, and the other one that we mentioned earlier on was the daemon set, right? Uh, and we kind of trimmed down the manifest that you'd be required to define your plugin. So that way you don't have to do a whole Kubernetes fully formed manifest because what happens on the aggregator is it basically ingests this predefined configuration and then it actually spews out a bunch of fully formed pods uh, using some of the ingested data. So the end-to-end -end test is an example where it's, it's really, um, you know, mm -hmm. focused. Um, so if folks want to do that, there's actually a document in the main, uh, you are in the main repo with regards to plugins. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are a bunch of vendors uh, who have a custom set of plugins that they've created. A good example uh, that people use is security set of plugins. Like mm -hmm. if, I'm, uh, if I want to run Aqua Security, sure. uh, I can basically run that and bundle that up as part of my qualification procedure. Uh, if people had sort of uh, different compliance that they wanted to run as part of the cluster lifecycle, mm -hmm. they could do that. If they want to do application lifecycle verification, basically like, you know the details of your app and I, you want to you know, prod the different portions of your app as you update it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's totally fine. Uh, this document basically outlines what you need to do to create your own plugins. Excellent. And if any of you listening are there interested in, in writing some of these or have written one, um, we'd love to have you on in a future office hours, maybe go through what it was like, uh, run it, you know, run it live, see, you know, make a, make a modification, see what happens, that sort of thing. So we can totally um, do that sort of thing. Uh, so if you're interested in that, ping, ping, ping us on the hash Sonobui, and we'd love to just, I don't know, I just feel like it'd be a cool office hours to sit down, write a plug-in, and have it working by the end kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of the soup to nets demo. Um, yep. So to write a plug-in, I think you could probably do a whole separate little shtick oh. on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you have interest in that and you have to do it anyway for work, uh, let me know. Um, okay, so we, we got the success. Um, what's yeah, next? We got, 
we got the success message. Um, you know, it's all done. Uh, it says success. So what happens at the end is Sonobui does a partial cleanup and then it's waiting, right? Okay. Sonobui right now is just sitting in idle mode. It's basically created an artifact right here. This is the name of the artifact uh, on, its, on its local machine uh, using Tempter uh, to basically roll up all the details for the Sonobui run. Right? Okay. Uh, so right now um, we have the YAML file there. Let's make a result stir. Change our results. Uh, then you run the Sonobui retrieve. Uh, and what that basically does is, is it communicates uh, with using the standard API to grab the data from that machine's tempter and copy it locally. So now you can, now you have the artifact and you can do cool. whatever you want with it. So I don't even need to CP it by hand. Okay, great. Yep. Um, so let's do a quick browse of some of the details inside here. Um, so there, Sonobuy, as we mentioned, uh, collects a lot more information than just the data that it was running, right? So I'll navigate over here real quick, um, go into the results. We can take a look here. Um, predefined JSON, oops. Um, it will basically collect a bunch of API information because as we mentioned earlier, um, you don't know when you have a failure, what happened, right? So it collects usually enough information for us to diagnose the problem. Predify the JSON. And you know, the more you dig into here, the more you, you realize it's a lot of information, right? Mm. It, by oh, default, cool. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, cool. it's cool that you show me the version because then I can kind of, if I'm testing an alpha version, right? Mm -hmm. That is that the intent there? To... Well, if you're, if you're dinking with your cluster, right, mm -hmm. then you want to be able to create an experiment. Um, you know, this allows you to get like all the details for your cluster information for you to see like how it's configured. So a good example here is like there's knobs on the main API that turn on and turn off different extension APIs, right? And here, it basically lists down all of the different APIs that are exists, right? So that's super useful. Like if I turn on some other configuration parameter, I can get a listing of other APIs that are enabled. Mm -hmm. okay. So by default, Sonobui will collect its own data too. Um, so that way, like if you had a problem running Sonobui and you want to submit a bug report, give us the tarball, and that's enough information for us to be able to usually diagnose if it's a Sonobui problem and where it's failing. Mm -hmm. right. um, then, as I mentioned before, like here's the actual plugins directory. It shows you what plugins you run. We ran the E2E. Uh, here's the actual end-to-end -end test logs. Uh, and all of this information, there's a bunch of metadata. So as I mentioned in the beginning, if you want to recreate the experiment, uh, it basically has all the detailed information for us to recreate ex the exact experiment that you ran. So if, uh, if there was a problem uh, and you call us or you, you, know, you submit a bug report, we can actually recreate uh, all the details that you, know, you had for running your, your experiment. So here's all the configuration you specified to Sonoboy. Uh, so it's going to cl collect all these resources. You're going to run these plugins. Uh, here's the server definition. Uh, here's all the other plugin details, yada, yada. And uh, it also defaults, like I mentioned before, there's other information for other plugins that you can collect data on, like the system D will collect the, the host logs across the machines uh, for your fleet. So that way, if you had a failure, you'd be able to actually dig through the fleet logs to understand where where something was failing. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's probably enough information for folks to sort of get the general gist of how it runs, what it collects. Um, then lastly, what you what you typically want to do is uh, clean up after it. Uh, so you do Sonobui delete. Uh, Sonobui delete will clean up all its information that's there. Uh, Poop control git. Uh, it's minus minus all namespaces. Now, what you might see 
as part of this, uh, which exists, is sometimes namespaces take a while to terminate. Sure. Right? And this is a known known. This is a Kubernetesism. This is not a sort of buism. Mm -hmm. So it might take a while for those things to fully clean up all their details. Sure. So we are running out of time here. And since we haven't had any questions, I just want to spend the last minute or so. Um, where do we get involved? Where's the GitHub? What's the TLDR on, on the future work here? I know this is all open source. Um, so I, uh, I don't know, like, what what's the next six months look like uh, for us here? Um, and inc include conformance as well, I think, just as a whole, as a holistic bit. So from a conformance perspective, that's only going to grow over time, as we mentioned. So there is a separate group of people who have been hired uh, by the CNCF to build out the test suite uh, for conformance to make nice. it much more robust. So mm -hmm. I expect in the 112 plus cycle to, to the conformance suite to keep on expanding. So right now, we mentioned earlier, it's about 180 different tests. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, over time, it'll probably tick upwards north of the several hundreds, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's the GitHub. We're on Slack on hash Sonobui on slack.kas.io or slack.kubernetes.io also works. And we do have a list, but it feels like people tend to work either in GitHub or on Slack. So um, we, we have a fair amount of regulars. Um, mm -hmm. There are people who basically depend upon it for their infrastructure, either sure. for their CI automation or as part of their lifecycle verification. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's commonly used. Um, we also have a uh, utility called scanner.heptio.com. So if okay. folks don't want to run the CLI and they just want to apply some YAML and get the results, Sure. Here's an easy way to do it. Um, so the main URL for the main project is uh, github.com slash heptio slash son of boy. And if folks are interested in engaging, you know, uh, there's a bunch of open issues. Uh, and we've had plenty of folks in the community kind of uh, uh, actively try to get engaged. One of the examples that people have been pushing on uh, have been like slowly getting support for ARM64 in mm -hmm. place. Uh, I know a lot of the packet folks have put in work here and some of the other ARM folks really want to get this in place to basically have the full conformance test suite available for, for ARM. Sure. Yep. I, I know I had someone ping me this morning about multi-arch containers for our stuff. So I, I need to follow up with that person. Currently the, the, the roadmap is we want to trek towards a 1.0 milestone. Um, there's a bunch of features in here. You'd have to grok it all to get the gist. But sure. if folks wanted to, there's our, our goal is in maybe in the set next six months or so to have a 1.0 release with a lot of the things I was mentioning earlier on the call uh, and a lot of other, you know, sort of UX cleanup work in place. Sure. Um, one of the things we want to do for the 1.0 release too, as well, is we actually have uh, a programmatic interface that people can use. Um, underneath package client, there's a, a separate interface. So it, if you wanted to build your own automation that's totally custom, that has its own runners and own sort of data mining facility, this is a, this is a means by which the, the power users use that. Sure. So basically write code against this interface to do customized configuration, customize everything to collect and, and after they get all the data, what people typically do is they put it into their data mining pipeline. Sure. So if they want to do alerting or sort of auto notification on lifecycle management of applications or the cluster, they, they have a full soup to nuts story with full automation. Right, right. So I think I think investigating that I think would be a good topic for our, for our second meeting. And like we said, uh, we want to have these regularly. Uh, so if there's anything you'd like to see or any more detail in any one of these areas, just let us know. Um, but this is this is really that's that's where the automation can come in for the sophisticated users, right? Yep. And, and and people do do this. We've had feedback uh, from some users. Uh, mm -hmm. Jimmy Dyson, who I've known for quite some time, an ex Red Hatter, I think now works at Mesosphere. Okay. Um, you know, has helped us actually fix some of these things that we've. You know, he's been a a constant power user for CI. Okay. So, yeah. And with that, we're get, we're about to wrap it up. Um, thanks everyone who listened in. This is our first office hours. Like we said, we're going to try to have these about once a cycle. Or you know, maybe if there's like a new feature or a bunch of new tests, I think it'd be really exciting now that there's going to be 
more conformance tests being added and the suite gets richer and richer and richer and, and more complicated. Um, it, I, I think it'll give, give people like a lot more confidence when they're deploying their clusters that, you know, hey, this took a while, but it, it does feel good the first time I, I ran, I set up my own cube admin just in my home lab. And having Sonobuy pass the first time kind of really makes it feel good that, you know, you can do this too. So I really, I really dig that. Well, that Tim, do you have any last comments or anybody have any comments in the Slack before we wrap it up? Nope. All right. Again, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Tim, for walking us uh, through this. And we'll see everyone next time. And we'll see you on Hash Sonobuoy. Thanks, everyone. Bye.